Hey everyone, thanks for joining me today to discuss what MBD is and why it matters. As my name is Aria and I am an Applications Engineer here at the CATI office in Bellevue, Washington, the Seattle area. So whether you've never heard of MBD, you've heard of it and you want to see how it works in SolidWorks, or you're already using it and you want to see how you can make downstream processes even faster, this webinar is going to have something for you. So before we actually get started talking about MBD and SolidWorks, Let's take a look at an example of why MBD exists at all. So on the left here, we have a BAE Systems Armored Multipurpose Vehicle, Ground Combat Vehicle. It's the new tank platform for the U.S. Army. And on the right, we have all the paperwork that's used to define this vehicle, everything used to create it. So that's going to include part drawings, assembly drawings, specs, bill of materials, ECOs, QA reports, so on and so forth, maintenance guides, that kind of thing. Now, this may be a little bit of a redundant question, but can you guess which one is heavier? Yeah, it actually ends up being the paperwork. So the paperwork used to define the tank is 42 tons, while the tank itself is 41 tons, which is kind of crazy. One of our customers at Textron has echoed this sentiment with a comment that every time we ship a product, we have a truckload of paperwork, we hate it, and we don't want to do it anymore. So this is kind of a cutesy example, but it nevertheless illustrates how dependent we are on our existing processes. I'm not here to tell you that all paperwork is bad and you should never print anything. Paperwork is always going to exist. But when you have 42 tons of it for a single project, there might be some room for improvement. So let's take a look at how we're currently doing things. So today we start in design by creating a 3D model that's intended for manufacturing. The engineers design that model, then take that model into the 2D drawing space and produce a manufacturing drawing of it containing all the dimensions, tolerances, specs, etc. required to produce a model. We then pass that 2D drawing file to the manufacturer to be produced. So it seems kind of funny because we start with 3D, we then go to 2D, and then we end up with a 3D part at the end of it. So it's kind of a strange translation process that we go through in our traditional manufacturing process here. And we'll see in a moment how this method can be susceptible to misinterpretation, out-of-date documents, incomplete information, and other factors that might contribute to produce an incorrect part. Now, the proposed process with MBD is to take that drawing out of the picture. So if we add all our manufacturing information directly to our 3D model and then share that data in formats that allow people that we're working with to interact, touch and feel the model, rotate it, take measurements, the same way that you can when you're working in SOLIDWORKS, wouldn't that be a little bit better? Wouldn't that reduce a little bit of the errors that we get from our 2D drawings going straight from the 3D model to the 3D part? So this is what we mean by saying model-based definition, or MBD. What we're doing is we're capturing product manufacturing information directly on the model. So this is going to include things like 3D dimensions, tolerances, annotations, etc. And everything on the model is going to update just like a drawing, but you don't even need to create the drawing. So for this presentation, we're going to look at how the tool SOLIDWORKS MBD has will allow us to capture this information, how we can share it with others, and also use it in other pieces of software downstream. But before we really get into it, I want to just go over a few of the acronyms that we're going to be using kind of consistently throughout the presentation today. The first one that we've kind of already mentioned here is PMI. Uh, the PMI refers to product manufacturing information. Again, the information actually necessary to make the part or the assembly. That's going to include things like the actual dimensions themselves, notes, bill materials, etc. Next acronym on the list here is MBD, which stands for model-based definition, as you probably know. Again, that's going to imply use of actually using the MBD inside a CAD system to convey information. You might share a file that may or may not actually have MBD associated with it. Now, the third acronym that we'll talk a, bit, talk a little bit about and get briefly into is model-based enterprise. So this is where you take that manufacturing information that's created in SOLIDWORKS MBD and use it outside of CAD for other phases in the product lifecycle, such as CAM or inspection, generating product guides, and so on. So this is the approach that we're going to look at a little bit in the presentation today, and we'll kind of talk about uh, how you can kind of even go further with model-based enterprise outside of what we'll talk about today. So to kind of just start off with the basics, kind of some basic questions you may have here is, you know, what is model-based definitions? Who's using it? Why is it important to use? How can we use it? We're using the tools that we may already have with SOLIDWORKS. And when am I going to need to start thinking about using it? We'll start off by talking about what it is. This is what we call the model-based enterprise approach with several different levels of adoption. It goes from only drawings on the left to full model-based enterprise on the right. 
Now, full model-based enterprise is level six. Um, it's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But we'll look at how we can get started with model-based definition in SOLIDWORKS. So let's start on the left at level zero. Level zero implies that only 2D drawings are being used and no 3D modeling software is being used. Everything is paper-based or just done in 2D CAD and needs to be cataloged or digitized and organized in that way. So hopefully none of us are at this level. If you own a license of SOLIDWORKS, you're already at level one. So give yourself a pat on the back. If you're already able to produce 3D models, save them out as CAD neutral file types, such as Step and IGIS, to share with manufacturers who may need those neutral files to use in their CAM program. But at level one, you're still heavily relying on supplying 2D drawings with your CAD neutral files to make sure that the part is manufactured correctly. In SOLIDWORKS 2018, the new feature is SOLIDWORKS CAM. With SOLIDWORKS CAM, you can achieve the level two in the scale here by taking SOLIDWORKS CAD model directly into CAM. So we have CAD CAM that are native in the same software suite. However, when you manufacture in-house or if you outsource manufacturing, at level two, you're still relying on the 2D drawing as the authoritative information source. And what I mean by that is what the drawing says goes. The drawing is the be-all, end-all, really, of the part or the assembly. These first three levels are referred to as the drawing-centric approach. The idea behind that being you still need a 2D drawing to supplement your 3D model and ensure that everything is manufactured correctly. With SOLIDWORKS MBD, you'll be able to reach level three, which is the first step in the model-centric approach. At this point, you're going to be using SOLIDWORKS MBD to create annotations and dimensions directly on the model and share the annotated 3D model with suppliers. Since the model has become the singular information source, this is where the model-centric approach starts, and everything is based on the model itself. And this is what we're going to talk about getting to today. So why do we need MBD? Well, one of the big reasons is that 2D drawings can be hard to understand and easy to misinterpret. So let's take, for example, this relatively simple 2D drawing. I'll look at the part that was manufactured using this drawing. So that you'll notice that there's a hole here that when we look at the, how the part was supposed to be manufactured, we realize that that hole was not supposed to be through. It should have been a blind hole. So due to a miscommunication in the drawing, that error was made. In this situation, if the customer had been using MBD, the manufacturer would have been able to rotate the part around, see that it was not a through hole, and this might have been avoided. So this problem, again, this, this is kind of an anecdotal example, but the problem itself has been actually quantified in the study by the Aberdeen Group, which is a tech consulting firm out of Boston. And they found that 30 to 40 percent of part nonconformances are due to inaccuracies and interpretation errors using 2D drawings. 30 to 40 percent, which is pretty remarkable. Furthermore, though, the Department of Defense, who's been one of the major players in kind of pushing MBD to the forefront, has found that one-third of all engineering dollars are spent on actually printing and maintaining, developing the 2D drawings, yet 60% of them still don't match the as-built state of the part for the 3D model. So again, if we go kind of back to that example of the stack of paper from the tank that we looked at before, so once the vehicle has been designed, of course, that doesn't mean that engineering has stopped. Lots of changes can be made as the vehicle goes through different revs. And a simple rev change can result in us updating that stack of paper you know, now we have two stacks of paper, and you can see how obviously this will grow exponentially in a long life cycle for a product as big as a tank. But even for other products, 2D drawings can be easy to get out of sync with the finish as existing product. So it's even worse for printing copies uh, as you get into paper management, paper wearing out, et cetera. It can be kind of difficult, even if you're storing everything digitally. So to kind of take that a step further, you know, I've kind of talked about why 2D drawings are bad. I want to make it clear that we're definitely not saying that 2D is terrible and MBD is going to replace 2D drawings overnight. 2D drawings are still going to be around. They're still going to be an important part of tech communication. But here are a few reasons why you might want to start thinking about incorporating MBD into your workflows. So MBD is going to help us reduce delivery times by reducing the time it takes to ensure 2D drawing files match our 3D models, because there's no need to do that. The, the 3D model is the authoritative information source. It's going to reduce complexity, because again, we only have that one file that includes all the information that we need. It's going to reduce scrap and rework, like the example that we looked at before. If we can reduce problems with misinterpretation, then we can reduce scrap and we can reduce rework. And then finally, it allows us to utilize our 3D assets better by being able to reuse PMI data. So once we set up a part with model-based definitions, we can use downstream software, such as CAM and inspection, to use that PMI. So again, this is kind of the distinction between model-based definition and model-based enterprise. And these are the examples that we'll look at in just a few minutes here. So to take a quick look at who is using it and another big reason to use it is that you might be required to. So some of you might work with customers who require or will be soon requiring model-based definition. It's really important to remember that a big proponent of model-based definition has been the Department of Defense and defense contractors. 
Boeing specifically is one of the largest and most successful implementations of model-based definitions, and they're the ones who kind of helped shape these industry standards that are laid out here. So it kind of started off with some of these aerospace contractors, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Honeywell, but it's moved beyond that. So there are a lot of other large companies and big industries that are using it as well. So we have the automotive industry that's recently started using MBD as well as other industries. Um, other common companies. But I want to make it clear that it's not just these gigantic companies that are using MBD. So today what we're going to look at is our, one of our customers called Ring Brothers. They're out of Wisconsin and I believe they only have one or two seats of SOLIDWORKS. And they've uh, graciously let us use one of their products to demonstrate how they have used the model-based enterprise approach using SOLIDWORKS model-based definitions, SOLIDWORKS CAM, and then inspection. You might have seen the Ring Brothers if you came to our 2018 launch event back in October and November of last year. They had a Camaro there that we showed. Uh, just a little background on them. Uh, they're a company founded by two brothers, Jim and Mike Ring, out of Spring Green, Wisconsin. Their shop serves as a collision and repair shop, but they also produce custom-built carts. So with their custom-built cars, they have custom-built parts. And here's an example of one of the cooler ones that they've made. So this is a redone 72 AMC Javelin AMX. And they use SOLIDWORKS to recreate the fenders. Basically everything from the windshield forward is carbon fiber. So the, the hood, the front fenders, et cetera. And this particular model is fitted with a supercharged Dodge Hellcat engine. So those Hellcat engines already make a ton of horsepower. But this one has been boosted past the stock about 700 to over 1,000 horsepower. So it's quite a car. And what we're going to be looking at here is one of the custom parts that the Ring Brothers designed and made for this car, which is the hood hinge. Now, it's a modest component, but they still needed something to ensure that the hood returned to the exact same spot every time it was opened. So they designed this custom hood hinge to achieve that goal. Let's take a closer look at this hood hinge assembly, specifically one of the control arms. We're going to look at how we can use MBD in this real world example of a model-based enterprise approach. So this is the control arm that we're going to be looking at, and this is the model-based definitions of this control arm that we're going to see once we're done with our first examples here. So we're going to walk through the life cycle of this product beginning after design has been completed. So design's already done. We're going to look at applying MBD using SOLIDWORKS MBD then taking those model-based definitions into SOLIDWORKS CAM and SOLIDWORKS inspection. And we'll see how it will save us some time in manufacturing and post-manufacturing QA. So the first step in the model-based definition approach in SOLIDWORKS is going to start with the DIM expert. Even if you've never used it, DIM expert has been in all versions of SOLIDWORKS since 2013. It was actually introduced back in 2008, but it was pushed out to all versions since MBD has become more prevalent in the last five years or so. DIM Expert is the tool in SOLIDWORKS we're going to use to go from the model on the left without annotation, the naked model, to the model with the PMI on the right. Uh, don't tell your boss you were looking at naked models in this presentation. So we've got our finished design here in SOLIDWORKS, and we'll start by accessing the DIM Expert Manager tab for the Feature Manager in SOLIDWORKS. So it's one of the tabs that has been there for a while, you may not have ever used it. We'll start by using Auto Dimension Scheme to have SOLIDWORKS automatically create dimensions for us. There are patterns here for the part type, whether it's a prismatic part or a turn part the tolerance type, as well as pattern dimensions. So we'll select our datums. We'll use the back face of the part for our primary datum. And we'll use the diameter of that main central bore for the secondary datum. Next, we can have SOLIDWORKS dimension everything, or we can select only the features that we want defined. In this case, we only need information for the mounting holes and that main pivot hole. So we'll select the main pivot hole there and then the two right and top mounting holes. And when we're finished, we see a number of dimensions have been automatically added, and we get some nice color coding that we see as well. So this color coding is called the show tolerance status, and this gives us a nice visual feedback of the fully defined faces in green and the underdefined faces in yellow. So as you can see here, it did a good job adding some dimensions with nice tolerances as well as GD and T, but we are going to have to do a little bit more work to fully define the rest of these faces here. So to continue defining the part, we're going to use the location dimension command. The location dimension is located uh, just in another one of our DIM expert commands here. And we can select any pair of faces, and DIM expert is automatically going to apply the dimension. So we'll start with the back face there, as well as the step face in that counterboard central hole. And we can see that dimension gets pulled in and click one more time to drop it. Selecting these other two faces here is going to finish off the dimensions for that main pivot hole. Parallel, angled, patterned, cylindrical faces are all going to be supported types of geometry using the DIM expert. Now we can kind of continue to pick and place our dimensions really just as easily as we would if we were using smart dimension in a sketch. Now we'll add one more dimension here from the tab face to the end of the raised box. And then one more time, just click to drop that last dimension. This looks pretty good, so we'll go ahead and check our tolerance status again to see where we're at. 
And it looks like we're pretty good, but we do still have one dimension, or excuse me, one feature that needs to be defined. The chamfer over on the left, you can see, is still showing up as yellow. All right, so let's go ahead and just turn off the tolerance status for now. And we're going to use another dim expert tool, the size dimension, to dimension that chamfer. This tool is going to recognize manufacturing features such as bosses, cones, fillets, in this case, the chamfer. And like the other tools, it's just a simple click to select the face and one more click to drop the dimension. Now, if we want to create a dimension for the location of that right mounting hole, we can have Dim Expert automatically create a basic dimension from the existing hole position dimension. So we'll go ahead and have it do that. We'll also do the same thing for that top mounting hole. At this point, we may need to do a little bit of cleanup. Repositioning dimensions works exactly as it does for sketches. We can simply click and drag to move them really wherever they need to go, just like we're used to doing for sketches. Checking the tolerance status again shows us that all of our faces are fully defined in green. We're ready to go on to using SOLIDWORKS MBD to actually document this now 3D annotated PMI part. All right, so we just saw that how Dim Expert will save us time by automatically creating dimensions for us. It informed us whether or not the part and or the features were fully defined using a tolerance status. It also has warnings and checks built into the background that will show us if we have tolerances that are missing or conflicting. That's also going to be checking over 100 GD&T rules in the background as well. Now, one of the things that's really important to note is that the DIM expert is going to work on both SOLIDWORKS native as well as imported geometry. So if you do need to bring in a step file and set up the PMI for it, you can do that as well. So the next step here, now that we have applied our DIM expert information, is that we're ready to start utilizing SOLIDWORKS MBD to take that information and start communicating it with others. Now, it's important to realize that SOLIDWORKS MBD is more just creating that PMI on a model that's part of it, but really what it is is a tool to organize and communicate the model and manufacturing information and keep everything in that single authoritative information source. So we're going to look at how we can do this with the case of a 3D PDF in SOLIDWORKS MBD. So we're going to begin by organizing our 3D product manufacturing information into what we call 3D views. So it's like we have 2D views in a drawing, we've got 3D views using MBD. 3D views are accessed from the tab in the lower portion of the SOLIDWORKS interface. Each view is going to contain as much or as little manufacturing information as necessary. And that PMI can be assigned to specific views if necessary. So we can kind of flip through the existing views here and take a look at them. We'll go back to that main view and access the annotations folder on the DIM expert tab, which is going to show us exactly which annotations are assigned to each standard view. So if we look at the front view here, we see the annotations for it, and we can hide those annotations just as easily. Now, if we want to create a new 3D view, we simply click Capture 3D View and select which annotations we want to include in our new view. In this case, we'll include all of our annotations. and go ahead and just name this All Dimensions. Now, when we confirm this view, what we'll see is that we kind of have a lot of annotations on the screen right now. There's sort of a lot going on. So what we'll do is use a tool called Dynamic Annotations. This is going to hide any annotations that are not relevant to the current view orientation. So as you see, as we rotate to a right view, we see just the annotations relevant to the right view. We'll see the same thing when we rotate to our front view as well as the top view. Double-clicking on the 3D view is going to reset its position. Now, if you have any configurations in your model, MBD is going to fully support the use of configurations as well, allowing you to designate which configuration to capture in the 3D view. So in this case, we'll go ahead and call out that no pockets kind of rough forged state configuration and capture this as its own new 3D view. In addition to configuration support, MBD is also going to support the ability to use 3D auxiliary views, so things like uh, section views, model break views. In this case, we'll do a model break view here. And just like setting up a model break views in a typical manner in SOLIDWORKS, we'll set it up the way that we usually do. So we have control over the actual break style. We'll go with a straight style. Of course, we can specify the distance there between the model edges. Now, when we're happy with this break view, we'll go ahead and capture this again as its own 3D view. This time, just calling out that model break view derived configuration. So things like exploded views, again, model break views, section views are all going to be supported. Now, notes are another great way of communicating information that otherwise can't be communicated using dimensions and other types of annotations. So using Dim Expert, we can create notes just like we would in a 2D drawing. So what we have here is a note that's already been added, just like it would have been in a 2D drawing. In this case, it's missing a material callout. So just like we'd be able to do back in drawings with notes, we can parametrically link this note to the custom property. So we'll go ahead and link it to that material property from the model. And if anything ever changes, if that material, the 1060 alloy, does change to something else, we will, of course, see that change propagate to this note. Now, before we publish our PMI in 3D views, 
Let's take a look at the 3D PDF template editor that comes with SOLIDWORKS MBD. That's actually going to allow us to specify how the 3D PDF is going to look. Opening up the 3D PDF template editor opens up in a separate window. And here we have the ability to fully customize the layout of the 3D PDF and make it look however our company standards require it to look. This template has fields for a company logo, placeholders for notes, custom properties from the model, as well as a viewport and a selection ribbon for additional views across the bottom. So really, however you need to make it look, you have full control over that here. Once we're ready to publish our information to 3D PDF, we'll go ahead and use the Publish to 3D PDF command. We can choose from an extensive list of templates that have come with SOLIDWORKS MBD or the one that we just created. Select the views that we'd like to include. So in this case, we'll go ahead and make sure all the views that we just recently created are selected to include in this 3D PDF. Now we also have the ability to specify to attach a file. So let's say you have an Excel bomb or maybe you have simulation results or something that you want to include as part of the 3D PDF. Again, the goal here is to keep all the information in one file and SOLIDWORKS allows us to do that here with attaching files. If necessary, if whoever you're working with does require a step 242 file, you can include that as well. Now the 3D PDF is going to pull custom properties so we can see the custom properties that are going to be carried over to the 3D PDF going to look to these custom properties to populate text fields. We also have the ability to parametrically link notes, so we'll go ahead and link that note that we created to the note field in the 3D PDF. And once it's generated, we can see and access all of our 3D views by selecting them in the view ribbon at the bottom. So we can see the right side view there, there's that original section view, the all dimensions view we created, the configuration view, and the break view. So if we go back to the all dimensions view, as we select dimensions in the 3D view, you'll notice that we do get dynamic highlighting showing exactly what geometry is being referred to. So there's no confusion there if there's an annotation that seems a little confusing. Zooming and rotating are also going to be supported. So you can really see how this is going to give the viewer a lot more information than a piece of paper really ever could. 3D PDF not only allows the use of section view, but also gives the user the ability to turn the section view on and off and also adjust the section properties, just like we could in SOLIDWORKS. So you can change the offset, tilt angles, etc. Allowing deeper interrogation of the model has the potential to drastically reduce errors associated with mis miscommunication, really just being as transparent as possible with what you need to have made, giving, all, giving the manufacturer all that information to make what they need. We do see the note field has come across in the PDF that has been linked to that model note. So we see all the notes that we had created before already have been brought over into this 3D PDF. There's even a field here for a changeable note. So we have included a changeable field. We'll just add a comment that this is going to need a first article inspection report. The 3D PDF, as I mentioned before, supports the ability to attach and download files that have been attached to the 3D PDF. So again, if we had attached those simulation reports or white papers or anything, we can download those attachments there. We also have helpful tools such as 3D measurements. So there is a ruler tool here that we can use to take measurements. So if there's, any, again, any sort of um, you know, lack of clarity, that can be dealt with using the measurement tool. Now you may be thinking, we've been able to do these things for years with e-drawings. Well, why are we looking at 3D PDFs? Well, what's awesome about the 3D PDF format is that it can be opened on any device, so PC, Mac, smartphone, tablet, Xbox, whatever it is. Anything that has Adobe Reader will be able to open a 3D PDF. Still going to be able to maintain these high standards and quality of technical communication and just make communicating that information all that much easier. All right, so we just thought with, how Sol with SOLIDWORKS MBD, we're able to organize only the information we need to communicate into 3D views. With the help of dynamic annotation, section and break views, we can reduce the guesswork in communicating the design of the model, reducing back and forth and making everything more efficient. Included with SOLIDWORKS MBD is the 3D PDF publisher, as well as the template editor, giving us full control over the layout of the PDF. SOLIDWORKS MBD also allows import and export of STEP 242 files and e-drawings. So if you want to go old school, you still have e-drawings. If the CAM system does require step 242, you have that option. So you've got to pick between those three formats there. So now that we've dimensioned and documented our design, we're ready to manufacture the model in SOLIDWORKS CAM. SOLIDWORKS CAM is going to use that same DIM expert information that we've already set up to automatically recognize and generate CNC machining data directly from the model. So let's see how we can do this in CAM. So here we have the control arm already set up in SOLIDWORKS CAM. We'll use tolerance-based machining to recognize features and choose machining strategies based on tolerances specified from DIM expert. Here we see all the machining features as well as our tolerance ranges. So what you'll see here is we have three sets of tolerance ranging from tight to loose. Now when we run tolerance-based machining, SOLIDWORKS CAM is automatically going to recognize features and apply strategies based on the tolerance ranges. So what it did is it recognized this hole and automatically chose the drill strategy based on the fit. 
Now, the benefit of having an integrated CAM system is that if you ever change anything in SOLIDWORKS and MBDE, CAM will recognize the changes in your model and adjust the programming to maintain spec. So in this case, let's go ahead and just change the tolerance type here for that upper hole. And we'll also change the tolerance for that main pivot hole. Let's go ahead and go with the tighter tolerance here. Now, when we come back into CAM, we're going to get a warning that the part has changed. We'll go ahead and do a full rebuild here. And SOLIDWORKS CAM is going to update all the strategies for each of the changed features. So parts that might have taken hours to program the machining information for manu manually can now be programmed automatically in just minutes. Much in the same way that a part automatically updates when you change a dimension, all your tools, feed, speed, depth of cut can be applied and changed automatically when you change MBD information. So taking a few easy steps to set up that product manufacturing information back in SOLIDWORKS MBD really helps us streamline this entire manufacturing process through SOLIDWORKS CAM. All right, and now as many of you may know, and as Chris just mentioned, if you have SOLIDWORKS 2018 and you are on active subscription, you already have SOLIDWORKS CAM. The use of DIM expert dimensions from SOLIDWORKS MBD in CAM is called tolerance-based machining, and once again, is going to be included with all versions of SOLIDWORKS on subscription. So if you have SOLIDWORKS, if you're on sub, this is something that you can use today. Tolerance-based machining will recognize your DIM expert dimensions, tolerance ranges, G and T, even things like surface finishes. Now the fourth phase in the model-based enterprise approach that we'll look at today is quality control. Now for those of you at the quality department, you might recognize this as the first article inspection report. And the typical process of generating these reports involves the engineering team creating a 3D part, generating a 2D drawing, and then passing that drawing off to quality control, who then takes that 2D drawing, identifies and extracts the critical dimensions, tedious process, then logs all those dimensions in an Excel spreadsheet for inspection records. Now, the vast majority of our customers are still doing this manually. And one of our customers, Tony Grado here, has mentioned that it takes them about two hours to balloon the drawing and another two hours to create the spreadsheet. So four hours to just set up the inspection report before any measurements are even taken. So once again, if we utilize those same DIM expert dimensions that we already have on the model, we can go directly from a 3D part to an inspection report, bypassing the need for that 2D drawing entirely once again. So once again, we'll return to our model with the DIM expert PMI already set up. SOLIDWORKS Inspection can generate our inspection project directly from the model using these dimensions and annotations. Let's kind of flip through our views here that we have created. We'll go back to our ISO view here and go ahead and start a new inspection project. To do that, we'll just choose a template. SOLIDWORKS Inspection then is going to instantly recognize and extract information from the model, such as custom properties, dimensions, and annotations. So here we can choose from our list of custom properties. We can even add custom properties if we need to. Next, we can choose the types of 3D annotations that we need extracted from the model for this specific inspection report. And once we click OK, SOLIDWORKS Inspection is going to automatically find and balloon those critical dimensions. Selecting an annotation in the characteristics tree is going to rotate to the corresponding view, display the annotations inspection information, and highlight it in the graphics area, making it really easy to see what we're looking at. So we see the full properties there. And once the model information has been captured, we can automatically generate that inspection report and export it. In this case, we'll go ahead and export it to Excel. Now, the Excel report that's generated is going to be an interactive spreadsheet. So what we can do is take the measurements on the physical part using our CMM system, enter the data into the report, and we get nice color coding that shows us which dimensions are intolerance and which are out of tolerance. At this point, you have the full power of Excel. So if you need to do anything else with that inspection report, you can do that within Excel. So as you can see, leveraging that existing 3D PMI information from SOLIDWORKS MBD exponentially sped up the process of creating an inspection report. We went from several hours to maybe a couple minutes to create that report. It also saved us from having multiple people do the same work several times. So once again, we looked at SOLIDWORKS inspection auto-generating inspection reports for both parts and assemblies, allowing us to take those into Excel-based first article inspection reports. All right, so we've looked at what MBD can do and why it's useful. Now, one big question is, when will I need it? So let's take a look at the lifecycle curve for MBD here. Since the launch of model-based definition back in 2008, or thereabouts, we've seen a few companies kind of lead the pack in the innovators portion of the lifecycle curve here. So again, that would be those companies such as Boeing, Lockheed, et cetera. Around 2010, we saw the automotive industry and several other industries kind of jump on board in that early adopters portion. At this point in 2018, we're kind of about the middle of that early majority portion of the life cycle. So at this point, we're starting to see manufacturing shops of all sizes begin to utilize model-based definitions and introduce that into their workflows. 
So based on that timeline, about 10 years or so, we can expect about another 10 years we'll start to see that late majority kind of tail off and get into that late adopters section of the life cycle curve here. So it is possible that in 10 to 15 years this could become the standard or it could become a standard that you would need for specific customers. So really, the simple answer is it's a good idea to get started thinking about implementing MBD. Again, some of you might already be working with customers who require it. So regardless of whether or not you're having to use MBD because of industry standards, well, we also saw how MBD, aside from having to use it, can be used for several real efficiency advantages. It's going to allow us to communicate our designs in a straightforward, direct way that's simply not possible with just 2D drawings, whether or not they're printed or a standard PDF. MBD includes built-in tools that allow us to check and verify our annotations and tolerances, giving us confidence in the design. Of course, taking the time to set up MBD streamlines both manufacturing as well as post-manufacturing processes, really with the ultimate result of minimizing expenses. We have a few testimonials here from a couple of the people who have been using MBD since the start and you know, have really been advocates for it about why it's something that's it's been a great introduction into the manufacturing process. All right, so with that, I just want to kind of highlight a few upcoming webinars that we're going to be having in the next a uh, couple of months here. So we've got our uh, free and powerful SolidWorks Express tools coming up on July 19th. We've got a Stratasys end use parts webinar coming up on the 31st. For those of you who work with PLM, we've got an Novia PLM webcast August 7th, and then a SolidWorks PDM webcast on the 14th of August, and then a DriveWorks automation webcast on the 21st. So if you've our inflow webinars then later in August. Sign up for any of these, just like you did for this webinar. You can go to cati.com slash events slash webinar schedule. And with that, I'd like to thank you guys for joining me today to discuss MBD and why it's useful. Thanks for joining.